talking, I realized the reason your name tag said Dr. Matt was because everyone's first name was on there. So every professor, everyone who had a doctorate said I doctor, you know, I, right, first it wasn't name. Just, it wasn't so I'm just, just like, oh, wow, he wants to go by Dr. Matt. And you're like, you can just call me Matt. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, no, I did not. Uh, I did not architect that. Um, yeah. I tend to. Um, I tend to issue titles. I think they're not effective in our modern society. Yeah, I, I had a, actually it was my very first podcast guest described as, it's like, I think they're helpful for maybe understanding what someone does, but they yes. by no means define what someone's worth is. No, they don't capture the fullness yeah. of the human experience. Yeah. But, but little in our society today does, I would argue. Well, I'm going to try as best as I can <laughs> in the next eight minutes to capture the full human experience enough, as man. much as I we love can. It. I so, love it. I love you know, it. and I'm going to read something off your profile on, sure. on Carnegie Mellon first, because, uh, you know, it's manufacturing happy hour. We got to get down to the basics to start. So, you know, your profile says your research is to develop robotic systems capable of operating in a complex dynamic environment or complex dynamic environments. How do you describe that to someone as if you're having a drink with them at like Kingfly Spirits, for sure. example, here in sure. Pittsburgh? <laughs> uh, the simplest way of describing it, and, and it's sort of what I learned here at, at CMU, is uh, field robotics. So mm -hmm. it means that you build robot systems that go out in the world and, and do tasks. And so uh, lots of parts of the world are unstructured and chaotic and dynamic. And so what that means is that's everything from... Uh, farms, city streets, uh, urban environments, uh, off-road environments. Mm -hmm. um, and really the kind of the purpose of field robotics is to build robotic systems that interact with the real world as it is, yeah. as opposed to trying to make the world bend to your robotic system. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so for me, that's great because it, it really has the spirit of adventure in it. Like yeah. why I liked field robotics is when I did my PhD, I got to go out on the oceans and deploy robots on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, when I was at CMU, I got to go to the desert and deploy robots that went from LA to Vegas. Yeah. Um, and so it really, really is this opportunity to, um, I feel like an explorer, feel like somebody that's uh, finding new things with robots. So. That's an awesome way to describe it. Where is, you mentioned two pretty exotic locations, the desert and the Great Barrier Reef. Where is the most exotic spot you've released a robot? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I would say uh, we had one of our robots do a submerged city okay. off southern Greece, the Peloponnese. So I don't know if it's exotic, but it definitely was one of the cooler deployments. Uh, the city submerged uh, due to kind of tectonic plate shifting sure. a couple thousand years ago and, you know, is completely underwater and we mapped it with robots. So that's, you know, it's a fun exciting Tuesday for me. Uh, <laughs> but it was, it was a really good time. That's awesome. Leveraging tech to explore the world in unique ways most people don't. So, well, I, I want to ask you, because we, we've been exploring ecosystems here on this podcast and at this event, and, and I want to understand for our listeners out there, what role does academia play in an ecosystem beyond the obvious, right? Obviously, training the next generation of engineers, tech talent, etc. But I'd love to hear you go beyond that. Yeah, so, you know, I think training is a big part of what we do, but I think another part that's probably less obvious is, is academia can serve as an amazing incubator for nascent fields. So even on the commercial aspects of this, you know, and we kind of talk about this in self-driving as one of these examples of a field that spent 30 years in academia before it really was ready for um, commercial applications. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is a great example that, you know, it often is really hard to try new things um, with the business cycle as fast as it is and the economy goes up and down. But one thing that's constant is that universities have been here for, uh, in many cases, hundreds of years yes. and will still be here. And I think that gives people a safe base to explore. Hmm. And unlike a startup, you can have five, eight, ten years to work on a project. And I think that plays a critical role in in fostering new technology. And so, you know, you know, one of the things that I think is non-obvious is that, you know, much of particularly R1 big research universities are dedicated to the research enterprise. And we teach students since a critical part of what we do. But that research component is really about, you know, building the future. And I think that is um, a reason we need to continue to invest in, yeah. in fundamental research. And mm -hmm. um, it can be easy to forget about that um, with all of the hype and excitement and money to be made. But I think that investment in fundamental research really does um, 
lay the groundwork for the future. Well, in your career, you go beyond research as well, because one, one thing that jumped out at me is you're also involved in Refraction AI. Um, you know, do you think being a co-founder of a company has helped you like in your work and, and ha- like, or maybe you should say, how has it helped you in your work? And is this unique for a professor to be involved in that? Or what do you see out there? No, I think it's, it's becoming increasingly common. And okay. for me, it's been an incredible opportunity. Uh, you know, we do a lot in my work to try to translate robots into the real world. And, you know, one of the things that's become more obvious as time as goes on is that you need economic models that allow you to scale um, robotic systems. And we're not going to off one research grant or off uh, some money from a foundation, you know, put a robot in every city in the world. We're not going to put it in everyone's home. And so, you know, the value of the sort of commercial applications of these systems really gives me the opportunity to try to fulfill that vision, which is to, to really scale robotic systems. Mm-hmm. I've learned a lot. Uh, it's been very humbling uh, to have the opportunity to do something very new, yeah. uh, something I had very little experience with. And so I think that's the other part of this that I really value is that one of the reasons I want to be an academic is that you constantly get to do new things. And it keeps you young because there's always new ideas, new students, um, new things to work on. And uh, doing a startup is a is a is another um, very visceral way of having that same experience. So I uh, have learned a lot both about you know how to develop plans that would allow you to make uh, robots again ubiquitous, and I think that is I think what we're going to need for the next. Um, 30 years if robotics is going to really uh, change people's lives. Well, just based on the way you describe what you do, I can tell robotics is keeping you young and adventurous, <laughs> right? And 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 to wrap this segment of the interview, I've kind of been asking everyone this, and, you know, where do you see robotics going, you know, in the next three years? So I actually think back to the talk you gave where you were talking, you, you showed that chart where you showed the decline of metalworking jobs and the rise of healthcare jobs. And I'm interested to maybe hear what you think about that in terms of job creation specific to a region like Pittsburgh or maybe beyond that as well. Yeah, look, you know, I think um, lots of people talk about job replacement in with robotics, and it's 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 a big fear. And I would say we have two narratives about it within the field itself. One is that you know robotics are an enabler of higher quality jobs, mm-hmm. of more more economic growth, and I think that is, is certainly true. But I think that that alone is perhaps not really going to address. Um, what that fear is. People are afraid of change and of their specific job, of their way of life being changed. And I think we need to address that head on. I don't think it's, it, it is uh, in service of the larger goal to not say, look, things are going to change and to be really upfront about that. Um, but to be honest, that I think if we go into that consciously with, with a real intention of um, making sure that we are doing that compassionately, we're doing it um, with thought and planning. And so it's not that we're replacing whole industries and people have mm-hmm. to change jobs or do something they didn't do before without warning, without strategy, without um, a longer term plan. So I, I think um, I do believe that we're going to see changes in a number of industries. Yeah. So I guess to answer your question, I think uh, we are going to see massive changes in everything from uh, manufacturing, construction, transportation, healthcare, um, you name it. And it's not just from robotics, it's also from AI and computer systems. But I think, you know, um, I have the luxury as an academic of, of, of not trying to sell you anything. And so I'm saying, <laughs> let me not tell you everything's going to be rosy. Let me tell you, let's be really careful. Yeah. And let's be really intentional. And let's make sure that um, we're bringing everyone along with us. And I think if we do that, there's a future with robots in it that is brighter than today. But I think um, there's also a future that is worse. Yeah. And you can look at other technologies that we've developed and, uh, you know, they can seem great. <laughs> and then um, you, you know, see the you, dark side. of Yeah. Them. You yeah. can imagine yeah. that. Um, uh, with maybe some more planning, we wouldn't have uh, our communication systems and Understood. our X and Y and Z doing all kinds of things that they are doing. So. Yep, yep. Well, no. In that case, we need to end with a call to action. Then, so what is the right way to communicate that? Hey, things are going to change, but because it sounds like we could be doing a better job of communicating that those changes coming. So, what would be your call to action around that? My call to action is that people that work in robotics, the people that I know, the people that are building companies, that are studying, that are academics, students there's one commonality that they have a true passion for building things and and 
almost to a person, they want to make the world a better place. And they want to use their energy, time, and efforts to make the world a better place. And so the call to action is to help um, collectively make sure that we are all pointing that energy, that that will, that desire for building new things in, in a direction that, that really does benefit humanity. And I think um, with education, with help, with planning, with uh, community, with government, with engagement, with all of those things, um, I think we can do that. And so my call to action is um, have conversations, connect, and talk to people outside of robotics or manufacturing or engineering more broadly and say, Hey, you know, what are you, what are you worried about? What do you care about? What matters to you and figure out how to make what you're doing uh, matter to them. And if you can do that, I think um, it goes a long way towards building a future again, that everybody feels they belong in. I appreciate you sharing some advice, sharing part of your story and for bringing the energy to manufacturing happy hour. So Matt, thanks so much for jumping on the show. Thanks so much for having me. Cheers. Cheers.